I am so happy to have Ian Honsberger with us today. So Ian has been a research scientist at the Geological Survey of Canada in Ottawa since 2017. His research focus is on orogenic gold systems and petrology-based studies in the northern, northern Appalachian mountain belt. And I'm super excited that he'll be teaching us all about orogenic gold systems of Newfoundland and making and breaking rocks through time. So this is going to be an awesome session. Please keep using the chat and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Ian, for joining. It's awesome having you here. Of course. Of course. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for having me. And um, pardon me if you hear a dog barking. I think he hears our voices and he's uh, he's barking. So anyway, he's not right now. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm actually sitting at that. You said that I'm on the traditional lands of the Algonquin here in Ottawa. So I'd just like to acknowledge that. Um, so today I'll talk about the orogenic gold systems uh, of Newfoundland. There's there's several of them. I'll talk about a few. And really, the story will be about making and breaking rocks through time. And I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, my name is Ian Hansberger. I'm a research scientist at the Geological Survey of Canada here in Ottawa. And this work is strongly collaborative. Um, just wanted to acknowledge a, a few um, collaborators. My colleague Hamish Sandeman at the Geological Survey of Newfoundland and Labrador is uh, largely uh, invested in this research. Vouter Bleeker of the Geological Survey of Canada has been a key player. Sandra Camo at the University of Toronto is helping out with geochronology and also various junior gold exploration companies in Newfoundland, um, as uh, there are several that have been very gracious in letting us, um, providing us access to their properties. So just to start, um, the really, so just playing off the title. So the making part, making and breaking rocks, I'll talk a lot about magma, a bit about magmatism and deposition, because this is really, although this is orogenic gold, these are orogenic gold systems typically thought to form from metamorphic fluids. Um, I'm, I won't talk about that aspect as much. However, there's lots of igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks along the gold belts that tell us a lot about the process evolution of these gold systems. Um, but the breaking part uh, refers to faulting, really, and it's really the faulting that's promoting fluid injection and emplacement of quartz bearing, um, or sorry, of gold bearing quartz veins. And the time piece uh, straightforward is geochronology. So I'll talk a bit about geochronology as well. Before I orient you in space where these gold systems, uh, where Newfoundland is, I just wanted to show you a couple of helicopter um, photo photographs from a helicopter of two different gold systems in Newfoundland. On the left is the Valentine Lake Gold Project. Uh, it's a 5 million ounce gold deposit, and this will be the site of the next gold mine in Newfoundland. It's currently in the mine construction stage, and you can see the quartz veins um, extending throughout the property here. And there's a major structure called the Valentine Lake Shear Zone that I'll talk a bit about as well. On the right is another very exciting um, prospective property in north north central Newfoundland, uh, the Queensway Gold Project. Um, it's in the earlier stages of exploration, um, but they are finding some really incredibly high gold values. Um, and as expected, you can see these lakes in that um, view. There's a major structure that uh, extends right through those lakes called the Appleton Fault Zone. So I'll talk a bit about the Appleton Fault Zone as well. And I'll also talk about a few other gold systems. So because this is a global audience, I just wanted to orient everyone where we are. So where the dot is in North America here is where I'm sitting. Um, it's in Ottawa, Ontario in Canada. Um, and our Newfoundland is part of the Appalachian Mountain Belt which is basically the eastern margin of North America. It's the northeasternmost extent of this mountain belt. So that white line traces the mountain belt. And Newfoundland sits right there. So just to get everyone oriented about where I'm talking about. And now we'll start zooming into Newfoundland a bit more. I'll show one overview slide of the um, Appalachians briefly right here. So this is a snapshot um, showing the Appalachian origin as well as the Caledonite origin. Um, in Mesozoic time. So you can see that's why Gondwana is so close and things are oriented a little bit differently than they are present day. But Newfoundland sits right in the center of this image. Um, the Appalachians are based, consist of a series of uh, accretionary terrains along the Laurentian margin. So all these colors represent different accretionary terrains and these terrains extend along strike in both directions. 
but I'll be focusing, and that actually has implications for gold as well, um, that you can ex expect these gold systems to extend a long strike. But I'll focus on Newfoundland for today. Um, really what brought me to the GSC, uh, the Geological Survey Canada in 2017, and working on the gold uh, systems in Newfoundland is, is really this figure summarizes it nicely. Um, the Newfoundland on the right, on the left is a geological map of the Archean Abitibi Greenstone Belt. Newfoundland are Paleozoic terrains. So these two terrains differ by um, lots of uh, billions of years in terms of geologic time. However, they show incredible similarity in terms of the scale of faulting, the location of gold, and the geology. So where you see yellow dots are the location of gold systems and the red are faults. Um, the Archean Abitibi Greenstone Belt is a world-class gold district, uh, one of the most prolific in the world. It's similar to some in Australia as well, um, in terms of, and actually Newfoundland is as well. I won't get into those comparisons today, but there are very there are similarities to other gold systems around the world, prolific gold systems. So this really stimulated um, re my research, and um, because of the the similarity, and the main question you ask is, okay, well is Newfoundland the site of the next uh, world-class gold district in Canada? I mean, the fact that it, it resembles um, the, green, the Archean Greenstone Belt so well. And it just so happens that there's a 5 million ounce gold deposit, the Valentine Lake gold deposit, right in the center of the diagram, this orange circle, um, that is in going into mine development as we speak. So now just looking at Newfoundland specifically, I've highlighted um, the cent center part of Newfoundland. Just This is where the, uh, most of the action is happening in terms of gold exploration. Um, Newfoundland is in the Appalachians. Have been, there's a series of, of zones that have been defined that go along strike. Um, I won't get into the, the nitty gritties, but we're located in the Dunnage zone, it's called, and the Gander zone. So the basically these two zones are um, of interest for for this talk. So I've, I've colored those zones. Um, and basically what you see here, what I've schematically shown is that there's a series of major fault systems, crustal scale faults throughout these zones, all of which contain orogenic gold mineralization. So uh, the black lines are the faults and I've made large triangles to show the direction of dip of those fault zones. Cause it turns out that the dip direction may play a pretty important role um, in focusing fluids for orogenic gold mineralization. So these are the four fault zones that I'll talk about today. Um, there's one in Northeast Newfoundland, sent right in the center of Newfoundland where the ne next gold mine will be, Southeast Newfoundland and then, or sorry, Southwest Newfoundland and then Southeast Newfoundland. So I'll start with Central Newfoundland where the Valentine Lake Gold Project is because um, we know the most about that system. And that's where I've done more work. Um, I've have have done more work in, on that system than the others. I've, I'm working on the others, but I wouldn't say we know quite as much um, in terms of the process evolution. So I'll start with Central Newfoundland, dead center Central Newfoundland. There's the fault system there, the uh, Valentine Lake Shear Zone, as I mentioned. Oh, I said Victoria Lake Shear Zone. That should be Valentine Lake Shear Zone. There's also a um, Victoria Lake Shear Zone nearby as well. So now zooming into that gold system, um, you see the red or on this map here is the generalized geologic map. And the geology really in this area, um, going from oldest rocks to youngest rocks, the oldest rocks are neoproterozoic plutonic rocks shown in this dark gray. Um, and it's actually those rocks that are mineralized um, at Valentine Lake, the 5 million ounce gold pro uh, um, prospect. And then above those, stratigraphically would be this Victoria Lake supergroup. Those are Canberra Ordovician volcanics and volcanic clastics. Um, and then there's a series of um, younger rocks that overlie those um, ranging in age from late Ordovician to um, latest Silurian. And the yellow, so the, the latest Silurian rocks, the yellow here are sedimentary rocks. Um, particularly, there's lots of polymic conglomerate and sandstones within these yellow units. The pinks, the greens, and the reds are late Silurian igneous rocks, all of very similar age 
Um, there's numerous rocks between 422 MA and 420 MA. And I'll get into that time period a bit more in terms of tectonics as we go along. Um, but really the key point is that you have these, these thin panels of conglomerate that are un in unconformably fault, they're in faulted contact with the Neoproterozoic rocks, um, but they're um, essentially re represent an un a major unconformity that's been reactivated. Um, and then these, these rocks down here in the um, lower part of the diagram in the, the tannish color are rocks of the Gander zone. So this is another accretionary terrain that's been um, accreted onto, for lack of a better term, to the rocks of the dunnage zone that I just described. So in the field, the Valentine Lake shear zone is quite well exposed on the surface. It's, it's quite spectacular to see. Um, here it is. Uh, looking, uh, it's oriented opposite of that map. So northwest to the right, southeast to the left, you have this Valentine Lake Pluton at 565 MA to the right. That's where the gold mineralization is. And then you have this Rogerson Lake conglomerate, it's called, this polymict conglomerate um, that is 422 MA um, or less. Uh, and I'll get into, we've dated some of those these rocks, so I'll get into where those ages come from. But I will note too that this polymic conglomerate is a diagnostic feature um, that is preserved along the fault zones. And you see the same thing in other gold systems globally. You, in the, in the Archean Abitibi Greenstone Belt, it's termed the Tamiskamine conglomerate, a very famous unit. And then in other areas of the world too, you see the same thing where you have polymic conglomerate so intimately associated with gold mineralization. So here's a couple of field shots of the mineralization itself. Um, mineralization occurs in flat-lying extension veins and then also fault fill veins. So it's your classic orogenic uh, system, um, and but most of the gold is coming out of the flat-lying extension veins to the left. You can see a person per scale. That's Wouter Bleeker. Um, and we've dated some rutile from these extension veins, these mineralized extension veins. And they came out to 411 plus or minus 4 MA. So that's our best guess for, for the age of the emplacement of these veins and presumably a gold forming event. Just up the road or along strike of Valentine Lake, there's a very impressive gold prospect called the Wilding Lake Gold Prospect. And you can see here this vein. Um, it's a very impressive vein. It extends for hundreds of kilometers, and it's up to two meters thick. You can see a person for scale, Case Van Stahl. Um, in this mineralization here, it's not within the Neoproterozoic rocks. It's within the conglomerate itself. So you can the conglomerate occurs on both sides of this vein, and there's a flat-lying foliation um, that's pretty obvious within the conglomerate um, on the left part of the screen. Quite, the, but quite a vein to see in the field. And we actually have an age that's come out of uh, this vein system as well. It's actually, it's come from a, a, a cross cutting vein um, that cuts across this, this larger um, main vein. And that we've dated rutile. And uh, by the way, we've used uh, TIMS, thermal ionization mass spectrometry for both of the, the rutile ages I'm talking about. And that came out to about 407 plus or minus approximately four. So it overlaps with an error of the, the 411 plus or minus four age from Valentine Lake. So we have a pretty good idea that mineralization is about 410 million years old. And that's really an event that's form, that's emplacing these um, major quartz veins. So I did some nitty gritty work on the Wilding Lake prospect. So I just wanted to show this um, because they're, they're nice vein systems. On the left is just a generalized geological map. The, the quartz veins are in gray. We did lots of structural work um, to pick apart um, various generations of structures and of vein sets. So on the right is a cross-section schematic across one of these main veins, and all the different colors represent different cross-cutting vein sets. So it's a pretty complex um, system. There's four generations, at least, of quartz veins. And we've the vein that we dated is actually one of these later V4 veins. So we think that all of these vein sets are forming at approximately the same time in terms of geologic time. Um, 
or the main veins coming in. And then very soon after there's um, basically the orientation of the stress field and there's different vein sets that are forming. So this is kind of the best um, model we have for a shear zone um, model at CA 410 MA. So we see this this unconformity I mentioned between the Neoproterozoic rocks and the late Silurian Rogerson Lake conglomerate. We see this along this belt. Um, this is a drill core photo with you have Rogerson Lake conglomerate on the top, and you have a Neoproterozoic granitoid on the bottom, and they're in sheared contact. So it's clearly a sheared unconformity. Um, so you have rocks 565 ma truncated against rocks that are 422 ma or less. So this is a key diagnostic feature of this, this central Newfoundland gold belt. Just to show pictures of gold, um, there is gold. There's plenty of gold in these rocks. Here's a thin section photo on the left. Um, the one on the right does not show gold, but the one on the left is a nice uh, example of common texture you'll see in thin section. There's gold um, included in a guttite altered pyrite. So these rocks are clearly went, they also have a very late, history of super gene alteration forming things like gotite so you have to look through some of that to get at the gold story we've dated a lot of the felsic um, igneous rocks along this belt as i mentioned when i've introduced the map and just here's a couple of field shots on the left um, both intrusive and extrusive rocks and consistently bringing back ages of 422 to 4ma and we have done the nitty gritty work to determine that these rocks were formed during an extensional event. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that extensional event as I go. But just to prove to you that um, we have looked at the geochemistry um, combined with the geologic observations and the structure um, seem to scream extension um, and, and the igneous rocks and the intrusive or the, uh, the intrusive rocks and the volcanic rocks all correlate, you have very similar rare earth elephant patterns. Um, and we think this really supports a 424 to 418 million year old extensional event. And it turns out that's a pretty key um, process that we see throughout the belt that is important, we think, for orogenic gold, for subsequent orogenic gold mineralization. And I'll get into that a bit more in tectonic model. Um, so the conglomerate, it's we were interested in dating the conglomerate for good reason. It's basically the marker of the fault, and we wanted to know the age and um, the deform. There's strongly deformed conglomerate uh, along the belt, right along the fault, which is hard to do anything with. However, there are entirely undeformed areas at the higher up sections of the conglomerate um, where you get you start getting into sandstone, and you can look at some of these sandstones in terms of um, the trital zircon to get ages of um, deposition. So on the right, what we've done is we have using laser ablation ICPMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, we, we basically use the laser to um, analyze a bunch of zircons within these undeformed sandstone sections of the conglomerate. And then what we did is we, taked, we took the, um, the four, in this case, the four youngest grains, and we uh, applied CAID TIMS, so chemical abrasion, isotope dilution, thermal ionization, mass spectrometry. Um, and this is work of Sandra Camo in her lab. She's been a great collaborator. And um, we determined that the youngest grain in this conglomerate was 421.9 plus or minus one. So we are fairly confident that the conglomerate is just barely younger than these 422 igneous rocks. And its maximum age is really 422 MA. Um, so that was a great finding because that tells us the age, approximate age of the faulting processes involved along the gold belt. There's also a lot of uh, argon argon geochronology that's been uh, done along this belt on muscovite and in white micas. So there's a range in these ages. I just wanted to bring this up because I'll come back to a synthesis diagram towards the end of the talk. But there's quite a range between about 380 uh, and 410 um, of, of muscovite. And these are muscovites in, that come directly from quartz veins in some cases. And then the 391 mica um, at the upper right is actually from the Rogerson Lake conglomerate. 
so there's so there's a cooling history and there's to be to be um to be understood in these rocks as well and these ages may be important for um recognizing another gold forming event um that's younger than the 410 that i mentioned before so i'll come back to that there are the there are the magnetism is strongly bimodal depending on where you are um, this is an example of one mafic dike uh, in the rogerson lake conglomerate it's strongly altered but the reason i show this we didn't we couldn't it's very hard to date these rocks the mafic ones well the mafic dike as such it's strongly altered um in metamorphose so that's why i bring this picture in because on the right you can see a thin section photo and we're talking about orogenic gold and if we if we want to start thinking about fluid sources in terms of metamorphism the these types of mafic rocks are probably the most helpful it's really hard to get metamorphic information out of the conglomerates um and the in the igneous rocks so anywho this was a, an, an interesting find there's chlorotoid in this mafic rock so that's consistent with lower green schist facies metamorphism in our interpretation so that was kind of a nice find um to just say yep yeah, okay well these are the kind of the ideal metamorphic conditions that we would expect um, in an orogenic system so based on all of our structural data um, and mapping uh, and field work, we've developed a cross-sectional model here um, across this Valentine Lake shear zone. So the, the purples are all those neoproterozoic, I'll say basement rocks for better term. They're um, basement in this, in this particular setting. Um, those are the 565 rocks. And then you have the thin little panel of Rogerson Lake conglomerate, the yellow. It's an extremely thin and it's pretty shallow upper crustal um, and it's squeezed essentially between these fault systems of opposing dip so on the right the faults are dipping to the southeast on the left the faults are dipping to the northwest and all of the mineralization seems to be focused kind of right where these opposingly dipping faults converge um, so we think that's important because of in terms of focusing fluid um, in this type of a setup you're essentially going to focus fluids within this triangular zone like um, region within these fault systems. Yeah, and this is just on the right is a little um, blow up of this of the right where you have the conglomerate um, in structural contact with the neoproterozoic basement. And this fault here is the Valentine Lake shear zone that I mentioned earlier. Um, and all the mineralization, as I said, is it's in the it's in the neoproterozoic rocks. So it's for the most part. The, the, it seems that there's there's mineralization in the conglomerate. However, it seems like most of the mineralization is within the uh, neoproterozoic basement in the hanging wall of the Valentine Lake shear zone. So now bringing it back to tectonics, there are lots of tectonic models to work with in Newfoundland. It's been studied for a very long time. Appalachians in general have. Um, so what, what I've done is just taken kind of one of the accepted models for um, this area of the world at about 425 and 418. And essentially at this time, what you have is you have a subduction zone. Um, and what we see is at this time, evidence for a major extensional event. So what we think it's, kind of, you can see I've uh, the, the frame that comes out to the, the front of the screen there, the lower part of the screen, that's a zoom in of the, the back image there in that area. And what we think is that there's something happening at depth be it slab tear, break off, perhaps delamination, um, is causing extension in the crust. And at that point, you're forming a major extensional fault system. You're emplacing all of these transitional to calc alkaline igneous rocks, and you're also depositing this conglomerate at this time. So there's a lot of action at this time. And we think that this really is a key prelude to orogenic gold mineralization because you're thinning the crust, you're increasing heat flow um, in the geothermal gradient, um, and you're basically getting fluids moving at this time in the late Silurian. And then it's this extensional fault system that is then reactivated um, a little bit later, like between 418 and 390 MA um, in a different tectonic setting. It's a subduction zone setting if you look in the back uh, panel, 
the upper panel there. However, there's actually a different accreted accretionary terrain that's being subducted at this point. And we think that it's really this reactivation event that's key for forming this triangle-like triangle -like zone. You can see these stars are gold mineralization. It's um, You're compressing the terrains, you're squeezing the Rogerson Lake conglomerate, which is in the center of this diagram. There's lots of fluids moving along these faults and you're forming orogenic gold. And this is really what we term gold event one in Newfoundland. And I'll talk a little bit about gold event two as I keep going. So that's the central Newfoundland story. And now I will get into the um, the other another fault system I showed on the first slide in northeast central Newfoundland. So here's that map coming back. That this fault system here, another wet northwest dipping fault system. Um, this is I showed the uh, this image from the helicopter in the beginning. The Queensway Gold Project occurs along this fault, the Appleton Fault Zone. So now I'll we're, we have done quite a bit of work in this area now, and we're really in kind of a data synthesis stage. Um, in terms of our of our research along this fault. This is just to show you some of the um, the geology. The, the geology is a little bit different um, in the, uh, along this fault, I'd say, than um, along the um, the, uh, the Valentine Lake Shear Zone. <laughs> Sorry, I have, I'm fighting a cold. Sorry. Um, anyway, I show the, the residual total, total magnetic field compilation on the right because it shows nicely that Min the, so the mineralization is really focused along this AFZ, the Appleton Fault Zone, but it's essentially a thick pile of sediment. Um, you can see here, like there's no evidence of a deeper basement. Um, these lows, these magnetic lows is blue. So we get mineralization in this big package of sediment here. Um, and I won't get into, it's called the David Rocks of the Davidsville Group, um, but I won't get into the all of the different names. Um, and there are various faults that run throughout um, this this area. So now I'll just give you a little bit of a tour of this fault system. And this is really where now being the gold mine in um, at Valentine Lake is just um, is is in construction now. The, the mine here we're in a little earlier stages, but exploration is thriving. I must say along along this fault system. Um, there's there's various companies that are that are drilling um, lots of, lots of drilling lots of exploration and prospecting. So the Appleton Fault is not well uh, is not well exposed on the surface. However, at depth, it's um, very clear. It's a it's a fault zone. If you look on the left here, you can see the rocks are are strongly deformed. Um, there's lots of micro slip going on, lots of folding, isoclinal folding, and so forth. And there is an impressive amount of vis visible gold um, along this fault system. The upper photo on the right is showing visible gold. This is a thin section photo of gold um, along along this fault system. I'll just add we 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 did try to date some rutile from these um, from a quartz vein along this um, fault system, but we were unsuccessful as of as of yet. So there may be more ages. Um, to, there may be a gold a mineralization age to come out of this, but very impressive um, VG at surface uh, in this along this fault. So the the structure really is characterized along this this belt of a series of thrust panels, and the thrust panels are typically marked by black shale. Makes sense, shale deforms easily. Once you start moving, once you start deforming it too, it's going to continue to promote thrusting. Um, so on the left is just an example of a northwest virgin thrust. And then there's also a lot of tectonization along this zone as well that includes shale. So some of the structure is chaotic. Most of it, we feel like most of the terrain is northwest vergent. It's verging to the northwest. However, um, there are some areas where everything is very steep and it's hard to tell the vergence direction. In terms of the sedimentary rocks, there are sedimentary and igneous rocks along this belt. The sedimentary rocks on the left, there's plenty of fossiliferous sandstones. Um, you can see here, um, very nice outcrop. And then there's this strongly transposed sandstone, silt, siltstone or turbidite sequences. You can see transposed layering right there within the turbidite. So there's strong deformation along the zone, but there's also 
almost undeformed fossiliferous sandstone in some uh, places as well. The igneous rocks is really kind of how this is different from the central Newfoundland gold, gold belt. You don't see the 422 MA um, igneous rocks like we do uh, where the Valentine Lake is. Here you see lots of gabbro intrusions and the gabbro intrusions vary in age widely. Um, there's some that have been dated as young as 381 MA on the right here. And that these are all mineralized, by the way, too. These gabbros do contain orogenic gold mineralization. So they're important for the gold story. They're providing a competent rock unit to, to break open and um, uh, form quartz veins. But then they these gabbros is the oldest age we have, not or that has been the oldest age coming out of this belt is at CA 453. So there's a wide age in the gabbro intrusions. Um, we're picking apart still the significance of these intrusions, but I will say it's a, these are characteristic of the gold of this this area of the world, and um, some of the mineralization is quite quite good too in um, in some of these gabbros. So some of the companies are drilling these for orogenic gold mineralization. So there's structural information that, that's coming out of these this area. Um, a couple of cross sections. If we look at the cross section in uh, the northern part of the map on the left, you can see the cross section on the right. It's an overall northwest virgin situation, but then you have tight isoclinal folding as well within these um, sedimentary sequences. The Appleton Fault would come through somewhere towards the right hand side of this diagram. It's unclear where the Appleton Fault goes up in the north here, but down along the Appleton or across the Appleton Fault, here's another cross section. This is the interpretation is that it's broadly a Northwest Virgin or West Virgin system, um, but gold mineralization, interestingly enough, is it seems is mostly focused along the Appleton Fault along this Northwest dipping structure. Um, and it kind of reminds me when you think of that, it's Northwest dipping, it reminds me of the Valentine Lake Shear Zone situation where you have an overall vergence towards one direction, but it's actually this fault that's verging in the opposite direction where you get the mineralization. So it, you start thinking about focusing fluids again. The Appleton Fault's a little more enigmatic. We don't really know um, its history as well. We don't know its nature. Um, it could, I think the going hypothesis in my mind is that it's either an overturned thrust. So originally a west or northwest verging thrust that's been um, steepened and overturned, or it's perhaps an extensional fault um, that's been reactivated. Um, so as a thrust fault. So it's it's a little bit tricky as to what the, the nature of the Appleton fault. So what's going to be very helpful with this is um, the company working in this area, Newfound Gold, they actually just completed a seismic survey, um, the first of its kind in Canada, and the information that comes out of that will really help to test this hypothesis. So we're all looking forward to that to those data, because that's really going to put the um, hit the nail in the uh, on the head in terms of what is the Appleton Fault doing at depth. We don't really know yet. Um, we have a, it's estimated from drill core that it's dipping about seventy degrees to the northwest. But anyway, that's that that will be coming, and we're looking forward to those data. The gold mineralization here are just these red dots are really where the big gold values are coming out of, right along the Appleton Fault. So now I'm going to move to a, those two, a two other fault zones that I don't know as much about, but I have spent a little bit of time. Um, so we'll move to Southwest Newfoundland. Uh, right here, you see this the this fault I've marked. This fault is actually northeast dipping so it's not dipping to the northwest which you kind of scratch your head because we've been seeing a little bit of a pattern with the two major exciting kind of areas for gold seems to be along northwest dipping faults so perhaps this area has seen more compression um so i'm not quite sure of the significance of the north of this of why this is dipping in the opposite direction perhaps there is a northwest dipping fault somewhere in there that's not mapped that's possible too. But anyway, this fault is mineralized um, and it's a fairly good sized deposit, um, but it's not um, it's it's not in production or it's not in mine construction stage yet. It's still just exploration. 
So here's a look at the regional geology along the Cape Ray Fault. Um, on the, the right, I'll start, start on the right, this is what the hanging wall looks like. Um, strongly deformed rocks of the Gander Zone that I mentioned, that accretionary terrain. And the Gander Zone along these faults is very, this is a very typical um, kind of, uh, this is the very typical texture or very typical folding. Um, isoclinal fold, strong deformation, you essentially form gneisses. There's higher grade metamorphism. You're uplifting higher grade rocks from depth along this fault. It's very clear. And there's some good timing on constraints on that, um, which actually match the timing of orogenic gold mineralization. So it, that's kind of a nice a nice thing. And then as you move closer to the fault on the left, you get these sheeted gneisses um, that are really characteristic of the geology. However, as you get right along the fault, you and you start looking at mineralization, you see there's been dated 424 MA igneous rocks. So very similar age igneous rocks to what we see farther to the northeast. So this is kind of a first order um, indication that this system is quite extensive and it's not just in one area, but you're getting this ge the same geology across the belt. Um, and there's also polymic conglomerate. Um, so we're very interested in this conglomerate. This conglomerate has had a little bit of a history of interpretation. Um, it's been, people haven't really known the age of this conglomerate. Um, it's been in question for years. Um, it's been considered to be Ordovician, probably, or maybe late Ordovician. We don't really, we haven't really had a sense of how old it is. Um, but all you, but this is on the left, you see a very nice sheared section of the conglomerate essentially right along the fault. So you see, this is right along the coast of southwestern Newfoundland. It's a beautiful outcrop. Um, this beautiful shear, shear bands um, and structure within that, that rock. But as we see elsewhere, there's also areas where the conglomerate is not deformed as you get farther away from the fault and also higher up in the section. Um, so you start getting into sandstone and siltstone um, interbedded with the conglomerate. So we said, oh, well, let's try to do what we did with the Rogerson Lake conglomerate and see if this is the Rogerson Lake conglomerate that's never really been tested before. So what we've done, this work is ongoing. We use the sensitive high resolution ion microprobe, the shrimp at the Geological Survey of Canada in Ottawa um, to analyze a bunch of detrital zircons from these sandstone rich sections. And turns out, there are Silurian grains that hold up statistically via the shrimp analysis. So what we're currently doing as we speak is we're analyzing the three or four youngest grains from this conglomerate to see if it's in fact Silurian or late Silurian. Um, and if it is, then we can make a strong hypothesis that this is the Rogerson Lake conglomerate, as you see farther to the northeast, and this is a one continuous system from central to southwest Newfoundland. So that would be quite quite interesting because this is a highly perspective. The Rogerson Lake conglomerate is considered to be like the marker unit for significant orogenic gold mineralization. So this is uh, this is uh, we're we're waiting on these results right now. Um, hopefully in the coming months, the uh, thermal ionization mass spectrometry results. So now I'll kind of start wrapping up, going into the oops, going into the area that I've spent the least amount of time in um, and looked at, and I'm just beginning really to look at this, this area in Southeast Central Newfoundland. Um, so sorry, I didn't bring the map in again, but it's the, um, it's the, the last fault system um, to the Southeast uh, part of the, the original map I showed. In this, you do have a Northwest dipping thrust called the Day Cove thrust. So another Northwest dipping thrust that's mineralized. Um, and you can see on the left, this is very close to the fault. You have Northwest dipping rocks um, in this field photo here. And then in the, in the foot wall of this fault, you see very similar rocks as you see down at uh, what I just showed at the Cape Ray fault zone of the Gander zone, these strongly deformed gneisses, you know, that have been um, exhumed and uplifted um, along some, some fault structures. So this is this is kind of a general overview of, of some of the, the general geology. This is a nice picture of 
there's some an impressive outcrop of orogenic gold bearing quartz veins. You can see there's multiple vein generations. Um, there's very high gold values that are coming out of this, um, coming out of these vein systems as well. This this area is in probably um, it's the exploration is not as far along as it is along the other um, areas, but it seems that it's strong. It's highly perspective for um, orogenic gold mineralizations as the other uh, fault zones are. And aha, you also see polymic conglomerate. So on the left is an outcrop of polymic conglomerate. Um, whoops, so the company exposed this, um, uh, that's working in that area, exposed this trench of, of polymic conglomerate. We haven't done anything with this conglomerate yet, um, but it's there, it's along the fault, very similar to, as you see, the Rogers and Lake conglomerate. So that was kind of a, it's a, another indication that, oh, okay, this is a fault system that we should be looking at more closely. And just for fun, I just wanted to bring in, um, there are there are more metals associated with the gold systems. This in, on the right is an example of a antimony um, bearing vein. So it's um, there there is antimony mineralization as well along this fault, and you also see antimony mineralization that I didn't talk about along the southern portion of the Appleton Fault. So there's clear associations with the antimony in, in the gold as well. So now I'll kind of start bringing it into the conclusions. Um, and I'm just going to show a couple of summary slides of geochronology and talk about the implications for orogenic gold mineralization. So here's a, an unpublished uh, map um, compiled by my collaborator, Hamish. And this is these are ages all over Newfoundland and um, of all the, of using different methods as well. And we think we see a pattern in terms of the ages there's lots of similarity. I won't go through all these ages, but however, if you put all these ages into more of a section um, from the Ordovician on, uh, up to the Devonian, there's groupings. There's very clear groupings across all of Newfoundland with the ages of um, mineralization. So what we think is the gold event one, which I talked about um, earlier, there's a grouping of ages between about 434 and 398. And we think that that's this kind of initial gold event. And then there potentially is a hiatus. And then there's a younger gold event between about 390 and 370. I showed some Muscovite ages in that age uh, range earlier. So we think there's really two, at least two main gold events um, along these, uh, across Newfoundland. And regardless of where you are, it seems that there's, um, the ages don't vary all that much. So remarkable similarity. Um, across areas. So just bringing this back, um, here's this gold event one that I talked about earlier, where we formed, where you're forming the triangular zone between the fault zones of opposing dip that basically come after the extensional event. But then what we think this gold event two, if we just take a general, an accepted model for the area, there's a lot happening in the lithosphere at this time. There's subduction, slab breakoff, there's various accretionary terrains that are coming in and being subducted. There's an oceans closing. Um, and we think that this is yet another younger gold event um, in this area. And there's probably this back thrusting, as we'll say, um, at this time as well, to form triangular like zones as well to focus fluids and so forth and heat. So really the themes um, of this talk our orogenic gold bearing veins are associated with crustal scale faults. It's not terribly new, but that's very clear. Um, there's mineralization along northwest dipping faults, not always, as I as I provided one example. Um, but it seems that those net northwest dipping faults may be important to setting up a triangle zone like geometry for focusing fluids. Um, so that may be a key. I ask people who are working in other gold systems around the world, Australia in particular, you may consider this um, in the systems you're working in because you do see triangle zone like setups in other areas globally as well that are associated with origin of gold. In Newfoundland, there's late Solarian polymic conglomerate and bimodal igneous rocks that are preserved along the crustal scale faults. So they may not be genetically important for the gold mineralization. However, 
They're very useful for understanding the history. And they also kind of scream that there's an extensional event that is a key prelude to subsequent origin at gold mineralization. And I did show the example, not everywhere do you get the conglomerate clearly exposed or bimodal or the late Silurian bimodal igneous rocks. However, um, we're actually finding now that there's more drilling that the conglomerates do seem to be pretty widespread and almost along um, along other fault systems where we haven't recognized them before. Um, these crustal scale, um, the crustal scale faults that are forming the orogenic gold mineralization are reactivating and overprinting unconformities formed during extension. So that's kind of a key point is that it's really the reactivation and the overprinting that's in, that's important for forming the um, the gold itself and the emplacement of the quartz veins. There's multiple generations of late Silurian to Devonian structurally controlled quartz veins. Um, as I showed for like Wilding Lake, that one snapshot, there was four different generations of quartz veins at approximately the same age. And some of them are mineralized, some of them aren't. So it's a, in some cases a matter of finding which generation is mineralized. There's at least two generations of orig orogenic gold mineralization, we think, based on the geochronology. Um, one being the late Silurian, early Devonian, this gold event one, and then the, the, the next being later in the Devonian, um, this gold event two. Um, just for plug for Newfoundland, um, there is a high potential for discovery um, in along these belts um, shown, and this is really evidenced by how well-funded these junior exploration companies are. There's major shareholder investments that are keeping these companies going, and they are doing their due diligence to um, really um, explore these these potential thrusts. Um, and I ask everyone just to not to zoom out from Newfoundland. Um, what can we learn about other orogenic gold systems globally from Newfoundland? I showed the one example of the Archean Abitibi Greenstone Belt, um, but also. I haven't worked in Australia, but some of my colleagues have, and they see very, very similar relationships on some of the major gold camps of Australia as well. So I think that's a key outcome of these, this type of research and vice versa. What can we learn about Newfoundland from other areas? And just pose one question is, will Newfoundland prove to be a world-class gold mining district? Um, there's great potential right now. It seems everyone is very excited um, about it. It's, it's, the gold rush that Newfoundland is seeing is unprecedented in the history of Newfoundland, Newfoundland exploration. Um, so it's a very excited time to be working there. Um, pretty incredible how many changes just in terms of infrastructure and the comp what the companies are doing. I've seen since I started working here over the past uh, six years. Um, it's like night and day from when I first started working and to today. It's everyone is very active. Um, in really chasing this gold, because I think a lot of people do think that this has potential to be a world-class gold mining district. Yeah, so I think I'm gonna, I'll end it there. Thank you for listening. Happy to discuss further answer questions. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. That was, yeah, really awesome.